Hello friends, in this video we will discuss about the anatomy of cerebellum. The specific objectives for this uh, topic will be describe the external features of the cerebellum and mention its blood supply. The second objective will be describe the internal structure of the cerebellum, its nuclei as well as some of the uh, important uh, connections. So to begin with the cerebellum, cerebellum as you know uh, is a smaller uh, part of the, uh, the central nervous system which is just uh, present uh, behind as well as below the cerebrum. So in this section you can see the cerebrum, the large uh, part of the, uh, the cerebrum which can be seen and just below that uh, here is the cerebellum. Uh, the size of this cerebellum is uh, almost one tenth of the cerebrum. So there is the large cerebrum and the cerebellum will be very small just one tenth and uh, it considered almost the weight of uh, uh, 150 grams. If you imagine uh, that the cerebrum is almost uh, 1500 uh, uh, grams then this will be almost approximately 150 grams almost uh, one tenth of the, the cerebrum. Just like that of the cerebrum, this uh, cerebellum also will have a superficial layer which will be made up of the gray matter. Just like in case of the cerebrum where we have the gray matter outside and the white matter inside. Similarly, even in the cerebellum, we have the gray matter outside. Gray matter is nothing but the collection of the uh, cell body neurons uh, and deep inside we have the white matter which will be the mainly the, the fibers of these neurons. Uh, so this uh, cerebr uh, the gray matter of the cerebellum outside this will be called as the cerebellar cortex similar to that of the cerebral cortex where the gray matter outside in the cerebrum will be called as the cerebral cortex. Similarly here we call this gray matter uh, of the cerebellum will be called as the cerebellar cortex. And just like that of the cerebrum, here also there are elevations as well as depressions which increase the surface area of the cerebellum. So there are depressions here, just like that of the sulci in case of the cerebrum, we have the fissures. Here they are called as fissures, depressions and here the gyri will be the elevations in the cerebrum. Uh, cerebrum. So similarly we have elevations here, these will be called as the foliae. Okay. So we have the fissures and foliae and the fissures are so large uh, th th that if we actually uh, spread it out the whole of the cerebellum it will be almost considered almost 50% of the cerebral cortex even though cerebral cortex is much more larger and uh, the cerebra cerebellum is just one tenth but if we uh, because of the numerous uh, fissures which are there uh, in this cerebellum. So uh, the surface area increases much more and even though it is just one tenth of the cerebral cortex but because of the numerous fissures the surface area, surface area is increased much more and it constitutes almost half of that of the, the cerebral cortex. So um, it is just 50 percent of the cerebral cortex even though the size is much more smaller but the numerous fissures that is the function of the the elevations and depression that is the fissures as well as the foliae it increase the surface area in a way and it can condense into a small area so even though it is just one tenth of the cerebral cortex but the surface area is almost half of that of the cerebral cortex okay uh, coming to the, uh, the position of this uh, uh, cerebellum, it is present in the posterior cranial fossa. Okay, as you know, the cerebr the whole of the cavity of the uh, this uh, 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 the skull is divided into the uh, the anterior cranial fossa. This here will be the anterior cranial fossa. Here this will be called as the the middle cranial fossa, and this will be the posterior cranial fossa. So this cerebellum is present in the posterior cranial fossa and just behind the, uh, the brain stem that is the main uh, parts of the brain stem that is the pons and the medulla oblongata. So this is the pons here and the medulla oblongata here and in between the pons and medulla oblongata and the cerebellum 
there is the fourth ventricle so the fourth ventricle separate the cerebellum from the pons and the middle oblomita if you can see this picture it is much more clear here this is the pons and here will be the middle oblongata and here is the cerebellum and the cerebellum is separated from the brain stem by this fourth ventricle here small cavity and here is the the midbrain and this is the cerebral cortex and this is the cerebellar cortex this whole is the cerebellum okay so this is uh, a brief introduction to this cerebellum now coming to the parts uh, it has two hemispheres uh, the right and left hemisphere so the cerebellar uh, uh, cerebellum has two hemispheres right and left so just like that of the the uh, cerebrum also Cere cerebrum also has the right and left hemispheres similarly we have the the right and the left hemispheres even in the cerebellum and these two uh, hemispheres are separated by a middle part a narrow middle part which looks like a worm that is called as vermis so this is the actual picture of the cerebellum and this is the picture drawn uh, and uh, if you can see here in the picture drawn you can the vermis is much more clear okay so this is the vermis and these are the two cerebellar hemispheres and uh, it is divided into uh, two surfaces superior surface as well as the inferior surface this is the side view okay this is the pons middle oblomita this is the midbrain and here is the cerebellum and this is the fourth ventricle if you see here the surface above which is in contact with the uh, that of the cerebellum uh, the cerebrum this will be called as the the superior surface and below this will be which is free that will be called as the inferior surface so here in this picture what you are seeing is the superior surface which is in contact with that of the, the cerebrum so here is the superior surface and below will be the inferior surface so there are two surfaces superior and inferior surface and two hemispheres right and left hemisphere separated by a worm like structure called as the vermis vermis is much more prominent clearly seen from uh, the inferior surface than the superior surface the superior surface shows no distinction between the vermis and the hemisphere as i said the vermis is not prominent here so it uh, just uh, there will be impression of the vermis on the superior surface but it is much more clear when you see from um, the inferior surface so this inferior surface shows a deep depression between the two hemispheres and this uh, space is called as the or uh, the depression is called as the vallecula which is seen prominently in the inferior surface and within the vallecula we can see uh, the uh, the vermis much more prominently and between uh, the vermis and the the two hemispheres there is a small uh, again uh, uh, depression which will be called as the paramedian sulcus between the hemisphere it is much more prominent in the the inferior surface but i am showing you on the superior surface here vermis and the the hemispheres cerebr cerebellar hemisphere there is a depression a groove so this will be called as the paramedian sulcus paramedian sulcus this will be as i said it will be seen in the much more prominently in the inferior surface okay so the vermis itself is present in a groove called as vallecula and in this uh, vallecula is the presence of the vermis and the uh, vermis is separated from the cerebra, cerebellar hemispheres by a sulcus called as the paramedian sulcus the two hemispheres are separated by a depression formed by the vermis called as the cerebellar notches which will be much more prominent in the anterior and posterior uh, regions so here there is uh, uh, the anterior depression and the posterior depression okay so these are called as notches the anterior notch and the posterior notch so the two hemispheres are separated by the depression formed by the vermis vermis is shorter compared to that of the hemispheres if you can see here this is shorter and this gives rise to notches here in the front and in the back so these are called as the anterior cerebellar notch and the posterior cerebellar notch and as you know very well uh, uh, the fox uh, cerebelli will be present in the posterior notch because here will be the fox cerebelli if you remember these are fox cerebelli is the uh, one of the four meningeal folds 
just like that of the the fox cerebri on the top which separates the two cerebral hemispheres the two cerebellar hemispheres are separated by the fox cerebelli here will be the fox cerebelli okay in the uh, and this is in contact with the posterior cerebellar notch so here will be the fox cerebelli which will separate the two cerebellar hemispheres so this is the section of the uh, uh, of the cerebellum as well as the section of the brain stem showing you the different features now the surface if you see the surfaces as i said this is not smooth but it will be giving rise to a lot of uh, depressions and elevations these are called as the the fissures as i said these are called as fissures these are transverse fissures if you see here in the uh, top uh, superior surface it, it will be much more prominent if you can see the vermis these are almost transversely placed to the vermis and these are called as the 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 depressions will be called as the fissures and the elevations will be called as the foliae okay so these leaf like structures narrow leaf like uh, bands which are present between the fissures this will be called as the foliae and i said they are numerous huge and this will increase the surface area by many times and it almost becomes uh, half of that of the the surface area if you compare the surface uh, surface area of the cerebellum with that of the cerebrum it becomes almost half of the cerebrum, uh, cerebrum. okay so this is uh, this is the surface okay which will be showing the fissures as well as the foliae section at right angles to this axis gives a characteristic feature tree like structure this is called as the arborvitae so if you take a section of the uh, this uh, cerebellum okay and uh, if you see uh, right angles to this axis it gives a uh, if it, this is the section taken and if you see here it looks like a tree so this is called as arborvitae means tree of life because this is a very important structure for life so this is called as tree of life okay so if we are taken the section so there will be a tree like uh, looking like structure deep inside so this is called as the arbor white okay section at right angles to this axis gives a characteristic tree like appearance called as arbor white or tree of life okay and now coming to two important fissures there are deep fissures apart from this uh, regular uh, fissures which are present here there are two more prominent deep fissures one is called as the primary fissure and the second is called as the posterior lateral fissure which will give rise to three lobes okay so if you can see here so uh, it is much more prominent here if you see here uh, there is primary fissure here so here will be the the primary fissure which is prominently much more uh, prominent on this side okay so this is called as uh, the primary fissure which separates the superior this is clearly seen on the superior surface the primary fissure will be on the superior surface which separates this cerebellum into an anterior lobe and the remaining part will be called as uh, the posterior lobe so now see the section and it we can appreciate it much more better so here is the the anterior uh, primary fissure fissura prima or fissure primary fissure it is called as fissura prima or primary fissure which separates the whole of the cerebe cerebellum into an anterior lobe which is in the front of this fissura prima and the remaining part the whole thing which is on the superior surface as well as the inferior surface this whole thing is called as the posterior lobe sometimes it is also called as the the middle lobe and there is a second fissure which is called as the posterior lateral fissure uh, this uh, is not very clear here but it can be shown here uh, okay so this is called as the primary fissure and the here there is a posterior lateral fissure which separates the posterior lobe from a, one more additional lobe this is called as the flocculo flocculo nodular lobe okay so there are three lobes anterior lobe and the posterior lobe sometimes as is uh, said uh, the posterior lobe is also called as middle lobe but usually it is called as posterior lobe anterior lobe and posterior lobe separated by the fissura prima or primary fissure then the posterior lobe is separated from a small structure called as the flocculo nodular lobe which is totally separated um, uh, almost separated from the the cerebellum and this is separated 
from the posterior lobe by a fissure called as the posterior lateral fissure. Posterior lateral fissure, uh, it can be seen here. This is the posterior lateral fissure, which is totally separating this structure from that of the cerebellum. This is called as the flocculonodular lobe. Okay. So this primary fish, uh, the anterior lobe and the middle lobe, these are the more two important constituents of this uh, cerebra, uh, cerebellum. Anterior lobe and the posterior lobe will co constitute almost uh, 98 or 97 percent of the whole of the uh, cerebellum. So this is called as uh, the corpus cerebelli, the main body of the cerebellum. Okay, so that is called as uh, the corpus. Corpus means body, cerebelli means cerebe uh, cerebellum. Okay, so anterior and posterior lobe together will be constituting the main part. So that's why it is called as uh, the corpus cerebelli. There is one more additional uh, fissure which will be uh, not very prominent but it will be more like an imaginary fissure which divide the superior surface from that of the inferior surface. Here there will be an additional uh, fissure called as the horizontal fissure which separate the superior surface from that of the inferior surface. This is much more imaginary than functionary. Uh, so this is called as the, the horizontal fissure. Okay. So this horizontal fissure divides the cerebellum into an upper and lower half seen on the superior and inferior surface respectively. Okay. So this will be much more in between somewhere here. So this is called as the, the horizontal fissure. So this is shown here, the whole of the cerebellum. This, if you can imagine, this is the suction just like that of the, this uh, uh, whole of the cerebellum is shown here. The superior surface, the inferior surface, and here will be the horizontal fissure, and here will be the fissure of prima. Okay, so this uh, is shown here. So you can see here, this whole of the superior surface separated from the inferior surface by a horizontal, horizontal fissure. Then the anterior lobe is separated from posterior lobe by a fissure called as the primary fissure and the posterior, uh, posterior lobe is separated from the flocculonodular lobe by a fissure called as the posterior lateral fissure. So this is how it looks like. This is the vermis and this is the, the cerebellar hemisphere. Okay, one side. Now coming to the uh, vermis itself. The vermis itself is again further divided into nine parts. Okay starting from the, uh, the anterior there is a structure called a lingula tongue like structure extending from the vermis so that's why it is called a lingula okay then we have the central lobule then culmen then decli then folium tuber pyramis this looks like a pyramid so it is called as pyramis then eula and then we have the nodule so each part of this vermis the nine parts the nine parts are there for the vermis as i said it is divided into nine parts and each part of this vermis is in relation to a part of the cerebellar hemisphere okay except except the lingula lingula is free except that part all each part of the vermis is related to a part within the the cerebellar hemispheres okay so what are those parts we'll talk about that okay so all the parts of the vermis nine among the nine parts all the parts except the lingula so it means eight parts are related to the cerebellar hemispheres one part lingula is not okay so now we will see what are these parts okay so the first part as you are seeing the lingula it is not related the second part is the central lobule okay so if you here you see central lobule it is related a part of the the anterior uh, uh, lobe of the cerebellar hemisphere this is called as uh, the ala okay so this is the ala which is related to central lobule then we have the the uh, culmen part of the vermis is related to a part of the cerebellar hemisphere uh, this is called as uh, the anterior quadrangular lobule okay so so this is the the culmen is related to the anterior quadrangular lobule okay so these ala and uh, anterior quadrangular lobule are the parts of the anterior lobe okay then next part will be from the posterior lobe so this anterior lobe is separated from posterior lobe by the uh, the anterior quadrangular uh, lobe here in the anterior lobe which is separated by the fissure uh, primary fissure or the fissure of prima from that of the posterior quadrangular lobule. 
So this posterior quadrangular lobe which is part of the posterior lobe is in relation to decli which is part of the vermis. Then the folium part of the vermis is related to the superior semilunar lobule. Okay. Then below that we have the tuber which is related to the inferior semilunar lobule. So the superior semilunar lobule is separated from the inferior uh, semilunar lobule by the horizontal fissure. So all these parts above this will be in the superior so these parts can be seen in the superior surface. Okay, now coming to the lower parts which are, can be uh, approached from the inferior surface. Okay, so the superior semilunar lobule of the cerebellar hemisphere is separated from the inferior semilunar lobule by the horizontal fissure which is as I said more imaginary okay, than functional or structural. Okay, then as I said each part of the vermis is related to a part of the uh, the cerebellar hemisphere but the tuber is not only related to the inferior semilunar lobule but it is also related to one more part of the cerebellar hemisphere called as the gracile lobule so this is the only part of the vermis which is related to two parts of the cerebellar hemisphere if you can see here all these are related to that uh, one one part of the cerebellar hemisphere except the tuber which is related to the inferior semilunar lobule as well as the the gracile lobe okay so there are two parts which are related to the tuber except that all other parts are related uh, to individually to one one part of the uh, vermis okay then we have the pyramis which is related to the biventral lobule okay biventral lobule then we have the eula which is related to the tonsil this looks like a tonsil in the oral cavity that's why it's called a tonsil and eula like the eula which is present in the oral cavity hanging from the roof okay so that's why it is called as a, the eula as well as beside that we have the the tonsil the, the eula and the tonsil beside it the uh, tonsil is the last part which is present in the posterior lobe and now the tonsil is separated from one more lobe here this is called as the flocculo nodular lobe by the posterior lateral fissure this is the second fissure primary fissure and the posterior lateral fissure is the second one and the uh, the posterior lobe is separated from the flocular nodular lobe by the posterior lateral fissure and this flocular nodular lobe is related to the nodule here okay so this is called as the flocculus and this is called as the nodule so that's what is called as the flocculo nodular lobe okay so this is a separate lobe so we have an anterior lobe which has two parts uh, within it as well as the quadrangular lobe then we have the the posterior lobe which has many parts and then we have the the flocular nodular lobe so these are the three lobes of the cerebellar hemisphere and these are the nine parts within the vermis which are related to the the cerebellar hemisphere except the lingula okay so this is what has been shown here the parts of the vermis and the relation related lobules on the cerebellar hemispheres are shown here these are the parts of the vermis and this is the parts of the cerebellum which are in relation to the the vermis except the lingula which is not related to any part so it is hanging separately like a tongue so it is called as the lingula so this is how it can be seen this is the superior surface this is the inferior surface this is the fourth ventricle this is the pons medulla oblongata this is the midbrain okay so this is the arbora vitae which looks like a tree when we take a section okay here it is much more prominently seen and this is the cerebellar cortex so this is the anterior lobe here separated from the posterior lobe by the fissure of prima and then we have the flocular nodular lobe which is a small lobe separated from the posterior lobe by the flocular nodular the uh, posterior lateral fissure now coming to the white matter as i said the gray matter is covering outside surface of the cerebellum deep inside we have the white matter as you know the white matter is made up of mainly of the fibers the central core is the white matter in each cerebellar hemisphere okay so there are two cerebellar hemisphere as you know the fibers leaving and entering the cerebellum pass through three thick bundles okay they very important structure which will be holding the the cerebellum okay in its position will be the fibers in the form of three bundles the superior bundle the or it is called also called as the superior cerebellar peduncle 
then we have the middle cerebellar peduncle and the inferior cerebellar peduncle here only the middle has been shown which is coming from the pons so the fibers coming from the pons are uh, uh, from the pons to the cerebellum or from the cerebellum to the pons so this will be in the uh, form of a bundle which is called as uh, the middle cerebellar uh, peduncle the fibers which are connecting the cerebellum to the uh, midbrain that will be called as uh, the superior cerebellar peduncle the um, fibers which are connecting the bundle of fibers which are uh, connecting the the cerebellum with that of the medulla oblongata that will be called as uh, the inferior cerebellar peduncle so these three peduncles will be holding the cerebellum uh, in its position if not it will fall down so it has to be held so this is held by the three peduncles which mainly constitute the the white matter the fibers okay so which are running either to the cerebellum or away from the cerebellum okay so the fibers which are entering uh, from the different parts of the uh, the brain stem into the cerebellum these are called as the efferent fibers which will be entering into the uh, the cerebellum so these are the efferent fibers so uh, the other types of fibers which will be present here will be the called as the projection fibers which are from the cerebellar cortex to the cerebellar nuclei deep inside are uh, the nuclei what are nuclei whenever we talk about nuclei in the the central nervous system it will be collection of the cell body neurons just remember that there are collection of cell body neurons within the white matter of the cerebellum also within the white matter so these are called as the cerebellar nuclei so the cerebellar nuclei are connected to the cerebellar cortex by fibers called as the projection fibers then there are some fibers called as the association fibers which are interconnecting different parts of the cerebellar cortex so the different functional areas are connected by to each other one part of the cerebellar cortex is connected to the other part of the cerebellar cortex by uh, something called as the association fibers then there are uh, fibers called as the commissural fibers which are connecting the two cerebellar hemispheres the two cerebellar hemispheres are not separated uh, but functionally they are in coordination so they have to be connected to each other so the two cerebellar hemispheres are connected uh, by fibers called the commissural fibers then so the last type of fibers will be efferent fibers the fibers which are going away from the cerebellum these will be called as the efferent fibers which are running from the cerebellum to different centers outside the cerebellum so these are the different types of fibers which are present within the white matter of the cerebellum one are efferent fibers the second is projection fibers the third is association fibers the fourth is the commissural fibers and the fifth will be the efferent fibers now coming to the uh, the uh, the nuclei which are present within the cerebellum uh, uh the cerebe cerebellum has four nuclei nuclei i said nuclei are those which are nothing but the collection of cell body neurons within the white matter so here if you see here so this is the cut section of the cerebellum here you can see outside we have the the gray matter which is called as the cerebellar cortex cerebellar cortex with the fissures as well as the foliae deep inside we can see the white matter within the white matter there are cell collection of cell body uh, of the neurons and these form nuclei so there are four nuclei four pairs of nuclei to be more specific the first one is called as the dentate nuclei this is the dentate nuclei the second is the emboliform nuclei the third is the globus nuclei and the fourth is the fastigial nuclei so these are the four pairs of the nuclei which are present in the uh, cerebellum uh, this is the uh, picture showing the a surface of the cerebellum the superior surface as well as the inferior surface but here you can see here deep inside this is just they have shown you the projection where exactly they might be present but they are deep inside not on the surface as shown here but they will be deep inside as you can see here okay so this is the the dentate nucleus the second one deep inside the dentate nucleus will be the emboliform then will the third one that is the globus and the fourth one 
which will be the fastigial nucleus so these are the four nuclei which are present uh, in pairs on either side of the uh, cerebellar hemispheres and uh, this can be seen within the cerebellum okay now uh, uh, the cerebellum uh, can be divided into three uh, parts depending on their uh, evolution okay during uh, depending on its development uh, it is said that the brain was primitive previously and then it evolved from there so depending on how the uh, cerebellum evolved uh, this will be divided into three types the first one is called as uh, the uh, archi cerebellum this is the most primitive type which is present even in case of the uh, lower animals and this is called as uh, the archi cerebellum okay so which one uh, is archi cerebellum in this uh, uh, part of the cerebellum which is shown in black here you can see the lingula part of the vermis then the nodule of the verme, uh, uh, the vermis as well as the the flocculus part of the uh, the cerebellum is uh, the archi cerebellum okay so this is the oldest primitive one the lingula as well as the flocculo nodular lobe so this will be the most primitive what is their function they are primarily connected to the vestibular uh, nuclei and are related with the maintenance of the body as well as the equilibrium okay so because yeah, equilibrium as well as maintenance of the body is very important even in case of the lower animals uh, uh, so this is uh, well developed uh, there as well as even in case of the human uh, beings the second type uh, which was evolved will be the paleo cerebellum okay so this is shaded uh, shown in shaded uh, dot like uh, areas so mainly the anterior lobe here which consists of the ala as well as the anterior quadrangular lobule as well as the uh, part of the vermis that is the central lobule as well as the culmen even if you see here below the pyramis as well as the eula also form the part of the paleo cerebellum so what is their function the connections are mainly to the spinal cord from this region or the spinal cord is directly connected from uh, the fibers coming mainly from the uh, spinal cord and what is the function mainly the maintenance of the tone of the muscle the muscle tone maintenance is very important okay and the final control of the movements like walking and other movements are mainly done by the the part of the uh, cerebellum which is called as the paleo cerebellum mainly the anterior lobe as well as part of the vermis okay so these parts will mainly uh, 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 important for the maintenance of the muscle tone as well as the some of the uh, finer control of the movement not the finest the finer control of movement okay coming to the most evolved uh, part of the cerebellum which is well developed in case of the uh, human beings that is called as the neo cerebellum which is unshaded mostly the the this is connected mainly to the the connections are mainly from or uh, to the cerebellar cortex so that's why uh, it is highly controlled by the cerebellar cortex and this is mainly important for the finer coordinated movements as well as the the voluntary movements okay fine coordinated movements like uh, writing the skilled movements okay uh, drawing painting uh, the artic uh, 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 the uh, finer controlled movements okay like drawing in case of the arts and other things okay so this is the uh, the most evolved type that is called as the neo cerebellum mainly controlled by the cerebellar cortex now coming to the uh, the main connections of the cerebellum we will not go into the details about these connections but we will just uh, name them and the detailed discussion will be about these uh, tracts will be in case of the physiology okay so what are the main afferent fibers of the cerebellum uh, which are coming to the cerebellum one is called as the the spino cerebellar tract if you can see here it is coming from the spinal cord and it is going to the cerebellum from either side of the spinal cord it is running and it is going to the cerebellum so uh, as you know the tracts are named mm, the first part will be from where it begins and the second part will be where it ends okay spino cerebellar indicates that it begins in the spinal cord and ends in the cerebellum okay and because it is coming from the uh, spinal cord so it will be mainly ending in the 
paleocerebellum as you can remember the paleocerebellum the connections are mainly from the r to the spinal cord okay and these are helping in the uh, finer coordinated movements of the uh, uh, as well as the muscle tone of the body okay okay the second is the pontocerebellar tract the pontine nucleus is here so the fibers coming from the cerebral cortex to the pontine nuclei and from there into the cerebellum so the fibers are from the pontine nucleus to the cerebellum these are called as the pontocerebellar because it is controlled uh, indirectly controlled by the cerebral cortex so it will be mainly going to the as we know already the neocerebellum neocerebellum is that part which is most evolved and it is mainly the the posterior lobe which helps in the finer coordinated movements of the body okay then we have the olio cerebellar uh, fibers or tract uh, uh, olio so this is the olio here if you see here this is the olio which is in the middle of longata as you remember this is very similar to that of uh, in shape it is related to the the dentate nucleus so you should be able to differentiate the dentate nucleus which is pre present in the cerebellum and the olivary nucleus which is mainly present in the medulla oblongata okay so the fibers which are running from the olivary nucleus to the cerebellum and they end also in the neocerebellum that is the posterior lobe of the cerebellum then we have the vestibular cerebellar which are coming beginning from the vestibular nuclei and ends in the cerebellum then we have the reticular nucleus this is from the uh, 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 reticular uh, formation and then uh, ends in the cerebellum so this is called as uh, the reticulo cerebellar uh, tract okay so these are some of the important tracts which are uh, uh, beginning from different parts of the body and ends in the cerebellum so these are called as uh, the efferent tracts okay then we have the efferent tracts which are starting from the cerebellum and going to different parts one is called as the cerebellum rubral okay so, so begins in the cerebellum and ends in the red nucleus so that's why they are called as the rubral okay begins in the cerebellum and ends in the red nucleus so these are called as the cerebellum rubral tract okay then some of the fibers which begins from the cerebellum goes to the thalamus so these are called as the cerebellum thalamic tract and from thalamus to the cerebral cortex the third type is the cerebellum uh, vestibular if you can see here this is the vestibular nucleus so some of the fibers are going from the vestibular nucleus to the cerebellum also some fibers will be running from the cerebellum to the vestibular nucleus so these fibers these are the efferent fibers begin from the cerebellum and ends in the vestibular nucleus so they are called as the cerebellum vestibular here it was vestibular cerebellar because it begins in the vestibular nucleus and ends in the cerebellum these were the efferent and the second type of fiber will be the these are the efferent fibers okay then we have the cerebellum reticular just like in the reticular formation they were beginning in the reticular formation and ending in the cerebellum so they were called as the reticulo cerebellar fibers or tracts okay now the reverse is happening some of the fibers begins in the cerebellum and ends in the reticular formation so these are called as the cerebellum reticular fibers okay so these are some of the important tracts afferent and different tracts which begin as well as end in the cerebellum which are directly related to the cerebellum okay now let's discuss some of the connections of the individual nuclei okay each individual nucleus will have some connections you know the, we have four connect, uh, nuclei within the cerebellum so we'll discuss about some uh, important features of this uh, individual uh, nuclei and their connections okay so the connections of the the first one that is the dentate nucleus, the largest nucleus that is the the dentate nucleus if you see here uh, the main efferents from the dentate nucleus will be to the the red nucleus and from there some will go to the inferior olivary nucleus see the dentate nucleus and the uh, olivary nucleus look similar but the dentate nucleus as i said will be present in the cerebellum and the olivary nucleus will be present in the medulla oblongata okay so so the dentate nucleus is connected to the inferior olivary nucleus uh, through the red nucleus okay then there are some fibers which are going to the thalamus and from there thalamus directly to the cerebral cortex mainly the motor as well as the premotor areas okay 
then uh, some of the fibers also the efferent fibers will be going to the reticular formation okay and then some of the fibers also uh, go to the the uh, nucleus uh, these are some of the efferent fibers now coming to the efferent fibers which are going to the uh, the dented nuclear itself the, the main the efferent fibers will be from the cerebellar cortex which directly controls the zone d of the cerebellar cortex will be directly in control with that of the the dentate nucleus and some of the other fibers also come uh, like from the inferior alveolar nucleus as well as from the reticular formation and others uh, fibers which are going from the reticular formation you can see directly fibers are going as well as some from the the spinal tract okay as well as from the inferior olivary nucleus but the main control will be from the cerebellar cortex zone d for the dentate nucleus okay then the connections of the emboliform nucleus so here you can see the emboliform nucleus this is the emboliform nucleus the main efferents will be to the again to the thalamus and from there to the cerebellar cortex okay mainly the the motor area the thalamus uh, uh, in the thalamus from the ventro posterior uh, lateral uh, uh, lobe uh, and from there to the cerebral cortex ventral posterior uh, lobe of the thalamus and from there to the cerebral cortex and some of the fibers also go uh, to the uh, and uh, they rely in the red nucleus and they are from directly into the uh, the uh, spinal tract okay and some fibers also go near the inferior olivary nucleus to the uh, accessory olivary nucleus not to the uh, uh, olivary nucleus itself but accessory olivary nucleus which is just beside that okay so it will be supplying the, the mainly the dorsal accessory uh, olivary nucleus there and some also fibers will be also going to the reticular formation of the pons as well as the middle oblongata. As you know, the reticular formation is present in the midbrain, pons, and middle oblongata throat. Okay, but it will be these fibers will mainly go into the fibers, uh, the reticular formation mainly the pons and the middle oblongata. Okay, so these are the main uh, efferents. Now coming to the efferent, the main efferent here also will be mainly controlled by the cerebellar cortex not the cerebral cortex, the, the cerebellar cortex, zone C1 as well as C3, okay. Then uh, some of the other fibers which will be collateral fibers coming from the uh, cerebellar efferents as well as some of the fibers which are going from the accessory nucleus also uh, to the cerebellar cortex, they also give some of the fibers here indirect fibers, okay. So these are some of the uh, connections of the emboliform nucleus. The third one is the globus nucleus. Okay, so here is the globus nucleus. So the main efferents again it will be to the thalamus, ventrolateral lobe, and then uh, also into the intralaminar uh, lobe of the thalamus. Okay, then uh, some fibers will be going to the superior colliculus. Some will be going to the some of the important uh, some of the nuclei there around, and some also supply even the the uh, medial uh, accessory olivary nucleus here okay uh, the main efferents uh, this uh, this were the efferents and the main efferent will be from the cerebellar cortex again here cerebral cortex but the zones are different here it is zone c2 okay which will make uh, mainly controlling then also from the the reticular formation of the middle uh, middle oblongata as well as the pons also uh, 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 supply or relay into the globus nucleus as well as some of the collaterals okay also uh, relay in the globus nucleus now coming to the uh, the vestigial uh, nucleus which is the smallest one even though it is the smallest one the vestigial nucleus but it has a lot of connections uh, the main connection as we know will be into the thalamus mainly the ventral as well as the intralaminar lobe and from there to the cerebral cortex motor area. The second connection will be to the midbrain mainly the red nucleus the gray uh, central gray as well as the superior colliculus and from there it runs as fibers uh, in the rubrospinal tract as well as some fibers will be going to the uh, the main uh, inferior olivary nucleus as well as the the uh, uh, the accessory nucleus also okay 
so here you can see the fibers going to the accessory mainly the medial accessory nucleus olivary nucleus okay some fibers also go to the reticular formation of the medulla as well as some fibers will be uh, related into the median as well as the spinal uh, vestibular nuclei and then they run as the the uh, the medial vestibular spinal tract as well as the medial reticular spinal tract okay within the the spinal cord spinal tracts of the spinal cord okay uh, the main afferents will be again from the cerebellar cortex now from the zone a of the cerebellar cortex which will be controlling the posterior nucleus but also some of the fibers are also coming from the vertical as well as horizontal gaze centers okay so these are some of the uh, important connections of the vestigial nucleus now coming to the the blood supply of the cerebellum the blood supply of the cerebellum uh, mainly the arterial supply is by uh, three important arteries the superior cerebellar branch of the basilar artery the anterior inferior cerebellar branch of the basilar artery as well as the posterior inferior cerebellar branch of the vertebral artery these are three arteries which will be supplying the the cerebellum the first one uh, the superior surface is mainly supplied by the superior cerebellar branch of the basilar artery here is the superior cerebellar branch of the basilar artery will enlarge the picture so that you can clearly appreciate so this is the superior cerebellar branch of the basilar artery this is the so this is the basilar artery basilar artery is formed by the two vertebral arteries the right and the left vertebral artery join together uh, in front of the medulla oblongata and runs uh, in the basilar groove on the anterior surface of the uh, pons okay this is the basilar artery and when it uh, near its termination it will be giving one important branch this is called as the superior cerebellar uh, artery and this will be mainly supplying the superior surface the superior surface is supplied by the superior cerebellar branch of the basilar artery the inferior surface is supplied by two arteries one artery is called as the anterior inferior cerebellar artery which is again a branch from the basilar artery at the beginning of the uh, uh, after the formation of the basilar artery at the beginning of this basilar artery it gives a branch this is called as the anterior inferior cerebellar artery so this will be supplying as well as one more artery will be supplying the inferior surface that is called as the posterior inferior cerebellar artery but this is not a branch from the basilar artery but it is a direct branch from the vertebral artery we can see here the vertebral artery gives a branch here the posterior inferior cerebellar artery then goes above on either side and joins as and forms the basilar artery so the inferior surface is supplied by two arter arteries the anterior inferior cerebellar artery which is a branch from the basilar artery as well as the posterior inferior cerebellar artery which is a branch from the vertebral artery this is different you should remember okay so these are the two uh, arteries which are supplying the inferior surface now coming to the venous drainage venous drainage is also uh, by uh, different uh, uh, dural venous sinuses uh, and it is different for the superior surface as well as the inferior surface the superior surface is drained by the straight venous sinus okay where is the straight sinus if you can see here this is the straight sinus okay so this is the cut section of the uh, the uh, the skull and here you can see the dural folds okay so this is the straight sinus okay this is the fox cerebelli which i was talking about here is the uh, fox cerebri and here is the fox cerebelli which uh, which is in relation to the posterior cerebellar notch which i was talking about okay coming to the uh, uh, venous uh, drainage the first uh, venous uh, vein will be the straight sinus which is a dural venous sinus which will be draining the the superior surface then the transverse sinus as well as the superior petrosal venous sinuses where is the transverse sinus this is the transverse sinus on either side the right and the left okay then the superior petrosal sinus the superior petrosal sinus which is there okay so these are the three uh, sinus dural venous sinus which will be draining the the superior surface the straight sinus which is single and the right and left transverse venous uh, transverse venous sinus as well as the right and left superior petrosal sinus which will be draining the superior surface now coming to the inferior surface inferior surface uh, is drained by the sigmoid sinus where is the sigmoid sinus if you take a section and see the base of the skull uh, from inside so this is the uh, 
the transverse sinus on either side so this is the right and uh, left transverse sinus and this continues as the sigmoid sinus here if you can see it is the sigmoid sinus on either side okay so the right and left sigmoid sinus as well as the inferior petrosal sinus this is the superior petrosal sinus and just below that will be inferior petrosal sinus so this is the superior here this one and this is the inferior petrosal sinus okay so the inferior surface will be drained by the right and left sigmoid sinus as well as the right and left inferior petrosal sinus as well as the occipital sinus where is occipital sinus so this is the occipital sinus a thin sinus which is running uh, at the beginning of the transverse and the left transverse sinus okay so this will be going below okay so this is the the uh, occipital sinus then we have the straight sinus we have already seen the straight sinus so here is the straight sinus and the transverse sinus will be on the either side and below will be the occipital sinus occipital sinus will be below okay so uh, the right and left sigmoid sinus will be draining the inferior surface as well as the right and left inferior petrosal sinus occipital sinus is single okay then the straight sinus is single so all this will be draining the the inferior surface of the uh, uh, the cerebellum so this is about the the superior surface uh, as well as the inferior surface venous drainage coming to the last part that is the functions of the cerebellum uh, the main as you know the main function of the cerebellum is the fine coordinated movements of the uh, the body which is much more well developed in case of as well as evolved in case of the human beings okay so the fine controlled movements like writing uh, like drawing painting all those things okay so this can be tested in case of an adult or a kid here the picture of a kid has been shown and a toy is held in front of him and he, uh, the doctor is asking him to touch either the nose or the eye or the ears of this toy okay this is how uh, you can kind of uh, check the uh, the intactness of the uh, the cerebellum or you can ask the uh, the person to write or draw or something like that okay of the equilibrium so this is very important okay equilibrium of the body to stand straight and walk straight so here you can see the doctor is checking the asking the patient to close his eyes and walk straight okay if the person can walk straight then it means that the cerebellum and its connections are intact and if the person has a, uh, a drunken gait then there is some problem there so this vestibular as well as the spinal connections are responsible for the maintenance of the equilibrium and it can be checked by the asking the patient to walk straight okay closing his eyes okay then the third is the uh, the cerebellar cortex also helps in the learning of the new movements okay okay it helps in uh, learning the new movements of the person and the fourth uh, uh, function of the cerebellum will be the it helps in the complex eye movements okay so here you can see the different eye movements so all these complex eye movements can be uh, done because of the intactness of the cerebellum so these are some of the important functions of the cerebellum one is the fine coordinated movements the second is the maintenance of the equilibrium the third is the learning of new movements and the fourth is the complex eye movements okay so this is all about the cerebellum Okay, if you have any doubts regarding this, you can uh, write to me and I will try to uh, reply. So these are my uh, references and the pictures are mainly uh, taken from here, uh, from especially from the Snells uh, as well as the uh, I.B. Singh, as well as K. Dakta, as well as the Student Grace. Okay, mainly from the Student Grace and from other uh, books also and sometimes even i have taken some of the pictures from the website so this is all about the cerebellum hi friends if you like my video and if you want to see similar kind of videos in the future subscribe to my channel as well as like the video press the bell icon so that you can get regular updates and you will be the first to get the updates then you can also comment as well as share this video with all your friends so that all can benefit from this thank you very much